Okay, good morning, everybody. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Hello, Mark, are you there? I am here, Sean, how are you? I'm well, are you able to come on camera? Are you, are you? Oh, let me see. With that? There's a, if you're familiar with Zoom, bottom left. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what. There you go. There's, a, there's, there, yep. there's a good there looking go. man. Hi. Good to see you, man. Um, <laughs> yeah, I understand. Uh, we, we played a little rugby together. We did. We played on the Denver Barbarians for a, a short period of time. Did um, you play for the Barbos? For a little while, for about a season, a little about a season and a half. So right. How do I not remember you playing for the Barbos? <laughs> I apologize. Well, I did. That's, I that did. Sort of seems, that seems arrogant and rude that I wouldn't remember you. But um, well, I mean, I, I was just I think I was just getting in there. And I think you had had a tenure as I think as a captain of the team and probably on the way out, if I'm not mistaken, it was probably what year was that then? I think it was around 94, 95, something like that. Maybe. OK, maybe, so, maybe, yeah, because I, I, I left the Barbos, 96. went to Boston. I was starting to get pretty busy uh, with a project. Um, actually, we might discuss it here. It was actually all about high intensity interval training and I was doing a lot of trade shows. And so it was a sort of around 96, I was sort of a little sporadic, but I actually ended up leaving um, for Boston in 97. So, and yeah, you I said it was I'm, 90 trying, I'm trying to think the last, cause I quit when I turned 30 and that was, um, I was born in 67. So I must've quit. Uh, somewhere around 97. So 96 probably is something where I was there. And okay. in fact, I remember actually, I gave you a ride home one time. And I remember because you were mentioning, <laughs> this is kind of funny, you were mentioning you're working as part of your research. And I think you're doing your doctorate then. And you're talking about this crazy paleo diet. Yeah. And you're talking about short, high intense interval training, like real short, you know, like yeah. 20 second, 30 second exercise sessions. I, I just remember, I thought, well, that's kind of interesting, you know, and, and that was, uh, yeah, where we were our paths crossed before. So it's good to see, uh, you know, some 20 some years later, I think wow. it's 25 that's, years later. That's crazy. Well, you know what? It might, maybe you were playing when I was perhaps, you know, not on the team full time, perhaps, you know, I was, you know, missing a few games because of what, what I was involved with. I'm just wondering if that was maybe the case. Well, I mean, the other thing I was, I was in the, I was in the pack and you were, you were one of those al aloof uh, <laughs> packs. And so you had no, <laughs> no yeah, yeah. Like, uh, you're, you're a what, what position do you play? You play in the pack. Oh, what is that? <laughs> you just give me the ball. Just give yeah, me those sweaty men all piled up. We'll stay away from those guys as much as yeah. possible. Exactly. So what was, so did you go to New Zealand after the Barbos then? Or? No, I was before. I went to New, I was in New Zealand in, in, in like 91, 92. And so okay. I, and I came back and then I played uh, for the armed forces teams. Uh, I was in, I was in Santa Barbara, played for Southern California. And then I went right. on to play for the West. And uh, you so know, did you go to Cal, did you go to Calgary? I did not, not for, oh, okay. not for so games. when, um, when your guy was like, Oh yeah, you play together. I assumed because I'd forgotten about the Barbos that, that it was on the West when, cause I captained the West up in uh, Calgary. But that was um, that was probably like ninety three, ninety four, or something like that. Yeah, I can't. I remember when I was in. I can't remember when I was playing up for the Western U.S. team. Uh, it was somewhere. I think it was before I even went to New Zealand, if I'm not mistaken. I think I started in like around ninety. Yeah, I think it was just my first year of medical school, so eighty nine, ninety, and then uh, got played on the Texas Select side, then got selected to the West side, and then I got recruited to go to New Zealand. So I jumped and left medical school, yeah. to New Zealand, and then came back later. Well, let me, uh, so Mark, this, <laughs> it's fun catching up on the rugby. Let people know a little bit about your background. Cause I, you know, I guess the rest of the folks probably could care less about the rugby, but uh, yeah, right. Yeah, tell tell yeah. me about uh, what's, what's your, what's your background. I know, like I said, you've got a PhD under Lauren Cordain, I believe. And uh, well, actually, uh, yeah. So actually I, I, my master's was with, was with Dr. Okay. Cordain. So actually, okay. so yeah, my background, I was a jock, you know, growing up. Um, I was a rugby tennis player. Um, and, uh, in the UK, uh, if you were a jock and you had any interest in sport, you know, you wanted a further education, it was the, the goal was to go to Loughborough university. Um, and that's, you know, the, the big sports science college there in the UK. Um, so that's where I went. I did a, a an undergrad, a bachelor's degree in sports science, PE in sports science. Um, and, uh, I stayed on and so I, you know, it was a huge rugby school. We were one of the top, top uh, rugby schools in the country. And honestly, I was probably going there to play rugby more than anything else. Um, but, uh, and then in fact, I stayed on for a year to play another year of rugby. And I'm not joking. Like we all did it. We all then did a, a teaching certificate, um, uh, which actually worked out very well because that actually ended up enabling me 
not necessarily to teach, <laughs> but to get a teaching assistantship at Colorado State University. So a buddy of mine on the rugby team, uh, I took a year out and actually went to Boston and played rugby uh, for Boston, um, uh, which was a fun year. I just did, just wanted to take a break. And a friend of mine uh, on the team had basically, it's kind of laughable, you know, it's like, where do I go to college? He's like, well, I'm going to go where the sun is. It's either Colorado, uh, Florida, or California. And he ended up getting um, a place at Colorado State University. So I went uh, during that year that I was in Boston. I actually took it when there was no rugby going on. I went and skied in uh, Breckenridge and went to visit him and met the head of the department. And I had better transcripts than him and he was doing very well. So I was basically offered a, an assistant, uh, a, a teaching assistantship on the spot. Um, so I was like, great. So I sort of had my, I was planning on going back to the UK to, you know, the, the, the game was starting to turn professional and I just assumed I would uh, follow that route. But then I got this offer to get a, a teaching assistantship and that's where uh, I met Dr. Cordain. Um, and at the time he was very, very new into paleolithic nutrition. I mean, he had started reading it, but I mean, he was known at that time for body composition. That, that was what he was working on. Um, so anyway, he became my advisor uh, for my master's degree. And I, back then, you know, even it was that new that I didn't even do anything pertaining to uh, nutrition in my, um, uh, my master's uh, thesis. I actually looked at something called inosine. I don't know if you remember that. That was a ergogenic aid that was fairly big in, in Russia. And it was actually one of the, uh, I don't know if you remember a guy What's his name? Tim. He was a big second row for Boston. Played for the U.S. But anyway, he he Tim Shields. Take, Tim, Tim, Shields. Tim Shields. Yeah, I think that's it. Anyway, he was like, oh, you know, you got to you got to investigate this stuff. So I did. Anyway, so it's kind of nonsense research, really. And uh, but while I was there, I um, uh, was able to um, get involved over the physiology department, and I had uh, quite a few of the students from the exercise science department were transferring over to do their doctorate in the physiology department. So that's what I did. And so I actually um, uh, went over there and, and did my doctorate in cardiovascular disease, um, looking at uh, a swine model for atherosclerosis. So I specifically, uh, from a research perspective, was looking at, you know, trying to attenuate atherosclerosis. So it was, um, a really good experience, I think, um, in terms of getting more medically orientated, I would say, because it was, you know, if, if I, I think at that time in particular, I think the sports science world was not as advanced as, say, you know, like a physiology department. And so I, I think it was a better move for me. To, um, I think it's changed these days when I look at some of the, the scientific work done in sports science departments. I think they've, they've come a long way. But at that time, I think it was a good move for me. So anyway, yeah, so I, I, I ended up doing my, my PhD in that. And, and at that time, that's when Dr. Cordain was getting more and more interested in the paleolithic nutrition. And obviously, you know, I was, I was in a teach, I actually was a teaching assistant um, for another two years. And I actually taught the, one of the big classes, they kind of put me almost as a professor, professor position. And I had graduate students underneath me. And so for two years, I did that. And then for the last two years, three years, then I was doing uh, on a research uh, stipend. So, but, um, so we were in contact a lot. And then when I finished my doctorate, I probably spent, um, I, I continued then as a, a, te a teaching in the department. And he and I, with another gal, we would meet sort of once a week. And this is where we, my sort of early years on, on paleontology nutrition developed. We were doing a lot of dietary analysis and, and it really stemmed from um, we were getting contacted by people that were interested um, from a perspective of autoimmune diseases. So we were saying, Hey, look, you know, there, there'd been quite a bit of um, uh, publications in the research on what we would call then elimination diets and people doing very well. And so we were sort of getting into that. And one of the first things we did was let's do some dietary analysis because it was that new that we didn't even know what were the consequences of eliminating grains, eliminating legumes, eliminating dairy, et cetera, et cetera. So we were doing those sort of dietary analysis and um, I was going off and doing lectures to all sorts of people. Um, and we were getting, you know, feedback from people that were then going, because yeah, we were sort of like, there's no harm in trying this, right? There, there, there were no consequence, there were no nutritional consequences to eliminating these foods. We actually found that by doing so, you actually increased um, the 13 most deficient nutrients uh, in the diet. And so we, we felt, 
you know, ethically fine to go, hey, yeah, you can try this. And we had a lot of people with autoimmune diseases uh, report back with some very positive effects. So um, I did that probably for about two, three years. And then I ended up uh, getting more into a project with high intensity interval training with the former department chair. Um, then I did that for a long time, obviously continued um, uh, working with people, advising them on diet and, and seeing great results. Um, then full circle, I ended up uh, eventually coming uh, to the desert here in Southern California, and I got involved with the Titleist Performance Institute, started doing a lot of work with uh, golf and tennis. Um, I was on their advisory board. I'm, I'm on their staff for, for education for cardiovascular based on high intense interval training and also on their nutritional advisory board. And then I set up my own practice uh, here back in 2006 and I've been uh, basically working as a practitioner, uh, working with primarily weekend warriors, but a number of professional athletes as well, uh, primarily in golf and, and tennis, uh, golf mainly. And uh, uh, then also got back involved with Dr. Cordain probably uh, a few years after that. And then uh, Trevor Connor, his last graduate student and myself, we kind of helped him sort of take over the website. And then Trevor actually bought the, the rights to the whole website and we've kind of reformulated things and he's really retired now, but uh, we, obviously we um, still talk frequently and uh, he's still part of the, the the team, if you like, from a writing perspective, and he's got one final project he's working on on, on longevity, which we're going to help him uh, get that information out. So that's a, you shouldn't have asked the question, right, Sean? <laughs> no, it gives us some great, great different topics to, to touch on. Did you ever run into a guy named Rob Wolf? Uh, I know he. Yeah, he sure. Helped. Yeah, we. I, I've not. I've not. Um, I had one. Only really one communication personally was um, it was when he he had written a rebuttal. I don't know if you remember there was a a lecture by Christina Warren, I think her name was, on a TED lecture um, bashing paleo, and I, I just you know went after her in a big way and wrote a big long rebuttal. And he and I connected over that, and he was like outstanding or something like that because I, I had a question for him. Um, so yes, yeah, so obviously I certainly know who Rob is, but are, are we you know? On a communicating basis, not, not not for any reason that we shouldn't be, but uh, I, I only communicated with him once. But uh, very very familiar with what you know his success and uh, his, his um, yeah. Uh, I mean, he obviously he he um, met with Dr. Cordain after I had left. Um, so yeah, I would have known him then if uh, um, I had still been there. But I had left Colorado at that time, so. Yeah, I, I think I'd mention that to Rob because I because I remember when I when I and I've, I've met Rob several times. I've talked with him quite a bit, and because yeah. you talk about the autoimmune, you know, uh, sort of a thing. And you know, if you don't know, this is a group of people. Many of them are all on elimination diets, meat based elimination diets, and right. many of them have seen tremendous success with with autoimmune disease, which right. probably is not surprising to you given given what you've seen in the background. But uh, did you make it? There's a lot of thought. There's a fellow by the name of. Uh, I believe it's Alondra, uh, Alessio Faisano out of Boston Children's sure. Hospital that talks about yeah, yeah. the gut, the gut, uh, you know, gut and uh, autoimmune connection. Was that something that you guys were looking at back in the day as well as, as a source of what was going on? Yeah, I mean, intestine permeability, I think, um, is probably one might even argue that that's where it all resides. Um, if, if the intestine isn't intact and, uh, and ha has an integral uh, sort of health that uh, then <laughs> shit hits the fan, so to speak. Um, so yeah, we were, I think, very aware of that. I, we weren't aware of the sort of depth of what was going on um, with, with um, I, actually the other thing I'm doing now, I'm actually teaching a couple of courses for universities and I've actually just finished um, developing a sports nutrition course. And that was a big part of one of the, the lectures that we did on his work in particular. Um, so um, we actually, and, I, and, and that's certainly a topic I'd like to get to with, with you in as much that, because I know you include a fair amount of dairy um, in, in your version of, of the carnivore diet, whereas Toth and Clemens, I believe they don't, right? I, I think on their paleolithic ketogenic diet. So one of the things we were looking at is if you, um, it was actually rather, it was about 2005, I think, where they actually found the receptor, the epidermal growth factor receptor, 
Um, and it was drug companies that found it because they were like interested in how are these lectins getting to the systemic system, identifying and because obviously their interest was well, if 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 we can get a peptide into the um, into the systemic system, maybe we don't have to inject insulin. Maybe there's another mechanism for doing it. So that's how the I think the research interest in that came about. So anyway, when they identified that epidermal growth factor receptor, um, it's there from an evolutionary perspective because we have a um, epidermal growth factor in our saliva, but in very, very small quantities. Now in milk, in cow's milk, um, beta cellulin and epidermal growth factor, we have it in you know, 5,000 fold quantities. So what has been shown is that that can upregulate that receptor and actually increase, uh, and obviously that, uh, well, I'm missing a point, that receptor can also uh, bind lectins. So a lot of lectins can then get into the systemic system. Having said that, I suppose the other thing is I'm thinking as I'm talking here, you're so, well, you don't basically have any anti-nutrients in your diet. So maybe that's why it's not an issue. Um, yeah. So well, I mean, um, I, I would comment on dairy markets to interject and I'm kind of agnostic on that because what I see just in practical uh, experience is some people do much better when they exclude dairy, but then there is a subset and I don't know how to, necessarily differentiate who who it is that seems to handle dairy quite well and there's some people that will talk about the different types of versions of dairy whether it's been pasteurized or whether it's come from an a1 or an a2 cow and those yeah, types of things. And yeah the quality if it's cheese versus liquid milk versus butter and ghee and so on and so forth so right right i, I think i think it's one of those things that i, I don't know the answer to i yeah. personally I, I personally minimize dairy for the most part. Sometimes I'll indulge in it more, but for the most part, I tend to do better actually without it, which would be oh, really? in okay. line with uh, what uh, I think Hordain originally proposed and, and some of that work. So I think yeah. there's something there. Um, it, it, but you're right. It, if it is through the binding of lectins and I'm on a very low lectin diet. And yeah, diet. exactly. You have what? Like zero lectins in your diet. So <laughs> it might not be an issue. But I, I think, you know, and the other thing that I would say, the way I look at nutrition is, uh, I really, I, I, I guess here's where I come from sometimes is like, I, I sometimes smile when I look at a lot of people that perhaps um, have, you know, a little bit of knowledge is dangerous and, and how they sort of form an opinion. I mean, I, honestly, even with all of the education I've had, I, I often feel really dumb and stupid when it comes to the human body, because I, I think I've just got an, a realization of if, if this is what there is to know about the human body, maybe we know this this much and um, maybe with a phd i know this much and most people know, you know there's, there's so much we we don't know that i i always have an open mind if i didn't have an open mind when i met cordain i would have said he's off his off his rocker and would have walked away um similarly now like you're you're advocating a carnivore diet i could be like well, they're nuts you know um but I, I don't do that you know what i do is, is i follow your your instagram feed and i i listen to people that are doing it and i go what, they're not lying. I, why would they lie? That clearly, people are doing very, very well. So pay attention. Let's try and learn from this. What what is going on? And I think you know we are so complex. You know we've got endogenous opioids in, in the brain that we don't even know what they do yet. So so when you say like dairy, for example, it, it could be you know the, the individual variability. Just the fact that people might think it's good for them could have a different effect on the body than someone that might think it's bad. And then the other side of what I was really gonna to get to with this point is quantities. I think negative foods in small quantities might be a good thing, right? It's almost like training in the gym. You know, what do we do for muscle adaptation? We actually, we actually cause damage to the muscle for it to repair and grow and get hypertrophy. So maybe the, that, that's true of the immune system. Maybe we need to sort of challenge it with a little bit. So if you're saying you don't do dairy a lot, maybe a little bit now and again is actually a good thing to sort of almost train your body to be able to handle it. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of talk around the hormetic effect of different foods and, you know, they, right. you know we, that's one of the supposed mechanisms by which uh, certain things, and there's a lot of ways to induce a hormetic stressor outside of nutrition as, as I'm sure, you know, right. um, let's, let's talk a little bit about exercise because that was something I, like I said, when I, when I was talking to you, you were, you were talking about these, I think it was very short intervals. It was 10 second, yeah. 30 second sprints. Right. What's been the, you know, now with 25 years of retrospective, uh, you know, knowledge on that, what's, what's the latest on that stuff? Um, I would say, well, actually, I think at the time um, you just said, you know, 10 seconds, or whatever. I think at the time we would have been talking, I would have probably not been talking 10 seconds. I would have been talking 60 seconds, maybe 30 seconds. And so the newer research is, 
showing the benefit, particularly with deconditioned people, of moving it down to like 10 seconds and how beneficial that can be. So um, I guess my, my sort of, for the audience, my sort of soapbox little lecture on, on uh, training, you know, we were indoctrinated into long, slow cardio, right? Aerobic activity um, from sort of the 70s and 80s. And the research uh, became very biased towards that. Um, so for your audience, I would say, I mean, it's somewhat ironic, um, a very famous uh, exercise ph physiologist, uh, Perloff Astrand, in 1967, developed the ability to measure VO2 max. And th that is, for, for the audience listening, that's basically the maximal uh, capacity of utilization of oxygen. And elite endurance athletes will tend to have higher VO2s than um, sedentary people or even college age females and males. So as an example, uh, college age uh, female has an average of about 35 milliliters per kilogram per minute and a, uh, a male about 45. Elite female endurance athletes could be in the 60s, 70s and males uh, 70s, 80s. However, you don't need those VO2 max values to be healthy. And even sort of back in the day, bodybuilders would have sort of 50s, you know, um, seeing this kind of training you're doing now, I would suspect, I don't know if you've uh, measured your VO2, I bet you're in the fifties, probably maybe even sixties. I don't, I don't know, but it's sort of irrelevant. We don't need those very, very high VO twos to be healthy. Um, so the, the first thing to say is, is that there was just a tremendous amount of research done on this, even though Ast Astran literally when he, um, presented the paper on, on how to do this, he said, we've got to be careful not to make fitness all about this one measurement. But that's exactly what happened. I mean, I remember being back in uh, uh, at Loughborough University and it was all about wanting to do VO2 max. Because at the time, exercise physiologists didn't have a lot uh, of tools in their toolbox other than this sort of ability to measure VO2. So it was like every graduate student wanted to do that. So it was almost like put a blue hat on, put gene, you know, see if that changes. And it was just almost like, everything was done around that. Um, and one of the problems I thought when I first started doing my research that we literally didn't have the ability to measure small amounts of um, uh, expired air. We did, it was just harder to do. So it was, it, the, the research was biased towards long, slow cardio uh, bouts of activity because at the, in those days we would catch all the air in a big what was called a douglas bag and you'd wheel it over to the the metabolic apparatus to actually measure the, the oxygen uh concentration and be able to work out how much oxygen the body had used so the research just got biased towards this kind of stuff and if we look at the old recommendations of 20 to 60 minutes duration three to five times per week um at, at an in, uh at an intensity of um uh like 50 to 85 VO2 max or um, 60 to 90 percent of max heart rate. That intensity is just by default when you have someone exercise for 20 to 60 minutes. Why were they doing it for that length of time? If you look at who the subjects were in those early research studies, they were students in classes. When did you have class? Three to five times per week. How long were the classes for? 20 to 60 minutes. You know, it's like you start to look at this and you're like, it was just that's all they looked at. When we start to look at the research of what I would say to people is like, okay, I'll give you that doing that kind of training can have a training effect, but it's not that impressive for, for uh, the amount of time that you put in. When you then start to look at the research and compare it to much higher intensity from much shorter duration, every time that short duration, high intensity typically trumps the long, slow duration. And the reason is the key ingredient for the body to change the stressor is the intensity not the duration of the activity. So more recent research now, if you look at the work, I mean, there's a very important study, uh, Marty Jabala up in Canada. Uh, he's done a tremendous amount of work on this and a very important study that really sort of even shocked me, even though when I was saying all of this, took college age males, had them, uh, they measured their VO2 max. Um, they then had them uh, ride at 80% of their VO2 max and see how long they could last. So they basically you know, measured the VO2 max so they could establish a power output of uh, 80%, 80%. They then had them do 30 second sprints. Um, they were doing, the protocol was four of them, 
with a four minute recovery between each one. So 30 seconds, four minute rest, 30 seconds, four minute rest, 30 seconds, four minute rest, 30 seconds, so two minutes. They would do that every other day. And interestingly here, they, this was a newer study because they had done studies previously where they were doing it every day and actually showed that there was a bit of a negative effect on doing it every day. In other words, the body needs rest. Um, so I always say inactivity is a bad thing, but rest is a good thing. And there's a big difference between those two things. So they were doing it every other day, two to three days. Bottom line is over two weeks, they did 16 minutes. So an average of eight minutes per week, just two weeks. That's all they did. They put them back on the bike at that same power output. And they said, how long can you last now? So in the first, the pre, they averaged 25 minutes uh, ability to stay at that percentage of 80%. What do you think it was uh, two weeks later with only 16 minutes, literally total training time? Yeah, I suspect it was no, no detriment and possibly a gain would be my oh, guess. Huge gain, double. They, they, so they went from 25 minutes to I think 52 or something like that. Uh, so, you know, not only are we improving our ability of our anaerobic sprint ability, we're also improving our anaerobic ability. And then the, that protocol that I just described there, once that was sort of in the literature, many, many researchers jumped on that protocol and started doing additional research. And they started sort of, the, I would say the big message is they started looking at even shorter bouts because with very deconditioned people, 30 seconds on a bike all out is, it's brutal. I mean, it's, it's, you know that, whereas 10 seconds is more doable. And then what they actually found was 10 seconds can actually still have a very, very significant training effect. And one of the big things that they've shown now with this, and I, and I do want to uh, talk in a second about when we talk about high intensity versus maximal effort, big difference. Um, but maximal effort, all out effort has a huge um, trainability on, on um, insulin sensitivity. So this sort of training is huge for diabetics, um, obviously, and diet plays a massive role too. But if we can combine the two, um, which would be very much in tune with being a hunter-gatherer, right? I would say if you couldn't sprint uh, away from a lion and get up a tree in about 60 seconds, if, if you don't get to a tree in 60 seconds, you're going to be out of the gene pool pretty quickly. So um, uh, I, I've, I've enjoyed watching your uh, uh, post with the ERG. I, I did a lot of work with US rowing. Um, when I was doing this high inter interval training. So I am very familiar with the ERG and I'm blown away by some of the times you're producing and, and the power output you're producing on that thing. I don't think most people realize those numbers and what they mean. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough to communicate because not there's very few people that, have, that can understand what those mean, particularly specific to a concept too. Uh, there, you know, as you know, there's a test called the Wingate test, which is, sure. uh, you know, most people have done that. It's a very, it's very, very difficult. It's a 30 second bike with with increasing right. resistance, and you repeat that. But one of the things, and this is something I've done for years now, I'd say, Marcus, I, you know, I remember when the Tabata protocol was talked about. Oh, this is, you know, get, you know, get me done yeah. on that. I'll yeah, and, and what that. I found was. Yeah, I mean, when you're talking about intensity, and I've always said, you know, and we look at the work to rest ratio, I think you've got to have enough rest so that you can hit intensity on each subsequent interval. Otherwise, you're just kind of, I think you're doing what's the point. And that's why I kind of, I've always kind of, I did Tabatas a few times. I said, this is kind of silly, but because by the time I got to my second or third rep, my intensity was shot. I wasn't doing anything. Okay, let, 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 me, let me give you the Go lowdown on, on Tabata and, and how it's been absolutely, uh the fitness industry, I mean, it's just talk about take something and just can ruin something. So, okay. So Tabata is a Japanese researcher that was looking at uh, skaters who they were looking at a particular skating event that lasted about two minutes and 40 seconds. So that protocol was trying to improve skaters that were exercising for two minutes and 40 seconds. So for them, that's a good protocol. All right, so it's sort of like a middle distance sort of athlete, right? Um, now, if you, so, so, so it, there is a place for it. But what I talk about more is just, if you're looking at your average person, they are gonna get greater gains if they do uh, a much higher intensity than that. So let, let's, let's step back a bit. Let's also talk about, people need to understand the difference between high intensity interval training and what we would call super maximal interval training or what I like to call sprint interval training. Obviously sprint in your head, if you talk about sprinting, it's all out, right? As hard as you can go. I think that's sort of intuitively people get that. Well, how long can you go 
when you're sprinting all out. It, it yeah, depends on seconds or something. Yeah. Depending. Yeah. It, it, I mean, if, if we look at power output, you know, 400 meters, we still consider that a sprint. I mean, hell, the, the 800 meters, I mean, most people couldn't keep up with them. <laughs> Actually, most people couldn't keep up with marathon runners, the speed they go. Um, but if we look at the 400 meters, we would obviously define that as very much as a sprint. And that's, you know, in the sort of 40 seconds, 50 seconds for elite athletes. Um, but if we look at the human body, we've got about a minute where we can go close to that kind of level. And at one minute, our power output precipitously drops off. I mean, it's just that's where our lactic acid levels get to the point where it just inhibits muscle contraction and we just drop off precipitately from the power output. So anywhere from 60 on down. All right. Now, what people misunderstand is they hear percentages of VO2 max and think 100% VO2 max is an all-out effort. It's not, not anywhere near an all-out effort. So let's just quickly understand some exercise physiology. When you do a stress test, if you, I mean, they do a stress with people with heart, heart disease and they don't do a, a maximal stress test. But um, as a graduate student in an exercise physiology department, all of us would have done stress tests, maximal stress tests quite a bit. So what happens there is there's different ways of doing it. But one way would be, let's say you're at five miles per hour on a treadmill on the flat grade. Every two to three minutes, they increase maybe two to three percent so that they're increasing the intensity of the exercise every two to three minutes. So they measure your oxygen utilization at each of those points. And what we see is it goes up and then eventually it starts to plateau and it reaches a maximum and typically you will max out as well. Some people, the fitter people can sort of last a little bit longer, but once that starts to get to that plateau, typically people, they, you know, they're done, they have to stop. So that's called your VO2 max. Now the workload relative to that is hundred percent VO2 max. So in, in a lot of people's minds and in the fitness industry, they see that number and they think hundred percent is an all out effort. If I put you on a treadmill at that speed that maxed you out, that took, 10 minutes to get to that point, you'd be able to do that no problem for a few minutes. And certainly, if we, to look, if we were to look at that, if we said, well, what is your maximal power output? Humans have the capability of maybe producing 200 to 250% VO2 max, right? So 100% VO2 max is not all out at all. But what happened is we, we get into this boot camp type stuff where it's go hard for a minute, easy for a minute, hard for a minute, easy for a minute, which is kind of the Tabata kind of approach. I mean, they were doing 10 seconds, 20 seconds recovery, 10 seconds, 20 seconds recovery, and they were doing eight of them. So their percentage was 170 in that study. So that's not all out, right? So my point to that is what's better? Doing 170% VO2 max effort like the Tabata for two minutes and 40 seconds, or is it better doing 250% at which when you're doing that kind of intensity, you can't go past 60 seconds. So if you were to do the Tabata approach of, okay, it's actually 20 seconds, I think with a 10 seconds recovery, right? I can't remember the protocol. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So what I tell people is, and, and this is what also a lot of people have done with the Tabata approach. If they're not doing uh, 170% via two max and they go all out, which I've seen a lot of people do once they've done three of those, they're wasting their time doing any more. What you should do then, so I actually do that a lot with my clients. At 20 seconds, I, I accumulate a minute many, many times, whether it's 230s with a 30 recovery or a 15 recovery. You can do sort of mini accumulations of, of a minute uh, is very effective, but don't go past the minute. Once you've reached one minute of all out effort, the human body needs a minimum of a four minute recovery to be able to replicate that kind of intensity, minimum. And I tell people, look, unless you have a reason, just wait until you feel you, you are ready to do that kind of intensity again. And four minutes goes really quickly when you've done that kind of effort. So uh, that's a big mistake I see people. So with all of my clients, um, if they're doing like, I like the upright stationary bike or the yoga, two of my favorites. If they're going all out, if, if we're not accumulating a minute and we're actually sometimes doing like the, 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 the Burgermaster or the, the Marty Jabala study, if you're doing 30 seconds, if it's a 30 seconds, I typically would have a three minute recovery, 60 seconds, a four minute recovery, uh, 20 seconds, I'd do a two minute recovery. But it also kind of depends upon the intensity. I, I, I think people are better off having at least four minutes. Um, 
Or an interesting approach, if you're in an environment, I've, I lecture with uh, the Talis Performance Institute to a lot of uh, healthcare professionals that are in an environment, I say, hey, do four of them throughout the day. So, you know, go on the erg, bang out a minute as hard as you can, and then get back to work. You're seeing clients when you've got a break later on. So then you can really maximize that. So if you, if you believe what I'm saying, that intensity is the greatest ingredient for change, then having a lot of recovery is very, very beneficial. Now, obviously, if you're an endurance athlete, then you know, at some point there's some benefit to reducing those, those recoveries so that you can maintain that kind of intensity uh, for long periods of time. But you know, for the games athletes and the sprint athletes and for general health, there's really no benefit to, to being able to run a marathon. Yeah, I've got no, no plans on my skills to run a marathon anytime soon. I, I just want to, I guess, you know, cause I have both the erg and I have the same sort of bike, you know, the, the, the fan bike, which, yeah, I mean, yeah. which is just a monstrous machine. And the difference of, because with the erg, there's a necessity, there's a, there's a recovery phase, you know, when you're, when you're pulling, whereas with the bike, it's constant go, there's no, there's no recovery pace. So every stroke I take, you know, uh, you know, half of it's uh, dedicated to pulling and the rest is recovery. So there's a little right. bit, I think the timing on that changes a little bit. So whereas I can do a longer rowing all out than I could a, a bicycle sprint. I, I mean, yeah, I, I just yeah found that. right, right. What I, I'd, I'd be interested because I got into, uh, you know, I've done, I haven't done it in eons, but there was a time when I was still playing in Boston um, that, that I wanted to see what I could do for the, um, the 2k. Um, so I did train, um, basically sort of, you know, it's like how a miler would train doing, um, basically like a quarter mile, then you'd, you'd have a four minute recovery. You do another quarter mile. So you basically accumulate the mile, um, with an interval based approach. And then you would gradually reduce the recovery for, you know, from four minutes to three minutes to two minutes to one minute, trying to put those pieces together. And then eventually you would actually increase the, the, the splits of the, of the 60 second intervals. So I, was, I used that approach for, for the ERG. And, and I think part of it was just, it was of interest when we were working with the, the product um, and doing a lot of trade shows, we ended up doing the Crash Bees in, uh, in Boston. And I remember watching Rob Waddell break the record, I think, at that time. And I just was blown away, you know, having done it myself and watching, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a fit guy and I'm pulling as hard as I can and maybe getting sub 125 for, uh, for a few pulls, which, you know, so I'm seeing you pulling 113. I'm like, huh? wow. Um, so I'm like getting just below 125 and maybe hold that for 100 meters or so. And here's a guy holding that for five and a half minutes and, and, and then gets up off the, the thing and goes and cools down like it was nothing. And I'm like just blown away. So I think the best I ever pulled for 2K was like six minutes, 47 seconds. Now I'm not an endurance athlete too. I'm a sprinter. So that was hard training for me to do that. But um, uh, have you ever bothered to try and see what a 2k could be i haven't done an all-out 2k I, I i messed around without any training and pulled a pretty comfortable 630 and i think i could Did probably, you really yeah i think i could probably get that close to that six minute mark if i if i dedicated my you know my best 500 was 114 i had the world record as a, as a wow. master 50 at 114 and so wow, that's insane well, well that's, you know, this is the thing i often tell people is like they don't realize it if you improve your ability to, you know your your ability to in to to pull that kind of intensity then when you go and pull 630 it, it, even though you wouldn't consider yourself an endurance athlete because you're so powerful you're sort of effectively you can do that working at a fairly low percentage right because you, your, your, your peak is so high um, you know you can sort of pull pretty good numbers at say 75 percent of, of maximum which is you know well below your anaerobic threshold so I think that's what people often don't realize how how beneficial High, you know, super maximal interval training, the kind of stuff you're doing can be for the human body. Yeah. And it's, you know, and obviously there's a difference in, in body type, you know, obviously I'm, I'm tall and, and fairly strong. And I think that sure. Rob Waddell, I think Rob Waddell was six foot six or something like that. Yeah. So he's a big, guy. big guy. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I went to the, I, I won the rowing world champions into a rowing world champions in Long Beach uh, la, year before last, before the you know, in 20, I guess it was before coronavirus so 2019. Wow. And, you know, I was, I was one of the, I'm six foot five and I was one of the sort of middling guys. I mean, there yeah, were yeah. You know, six, eight, six, ten guys walking around where the guy that won the overall was this, a Ukrainian six foot 10, uh, you know, and it was a 500 meter sprint. I think he beat me by about 
uh, two seconds or something like so I was pretty pleased you know keep up with a 25 year old Olympian at 50 yeah. or whatever whatever seriously was yeah no I mean that, that those are insane numbers I mean as I said Lena most people would probably look at that and just the shrug in the shell is going, oh, yeah, pretty good. Like, no, <laughs> you have no idea how good that is. Yeah, well, well I, like I said, I, it, it's something you try to communicate with other people. They, it, they don't quite get it. But let's talk about, uh, you had touched on longevity. And I know, you know, and I think it's very nice that you said we know this much of a of that much. And I think that's very true. The more you look at the human body and the science, the more things you discover and the things you thought were true five years ago now are dependent upon 16 other variables that we've now discovered. Yeah, right. but longevity, you know, and longevity research, I'm always very, a little bit skeptical. And I say, well, show me the money. Where's it, where's the results. And I, and when it comes to humans, I've just not seen any compelling results that, that, you know, I don't see people at 120 walking around that are in tremendous health. I just, I've just yet to see that, but having, you know, having, you know, put that caveat out there and you mentioned, you know, maybe having a VO2 max of 70 is not an advantage when it comes to health or, or perhaps longevity. Do you want to comment on some of the longevity stuff or what we think we know at this point? I've, I've got to be careful as much that uh, Dr. Cordain is, uh, he, is putting a book out on this. So I don't want to give away a lot of his, um, what he feels is things he missed uh, in his earlier books and sort of some of the, the newer things that he thinks are important. I will say that he's pretty much uh, debunked the blue zone uh, stuff. And actually some of the uh, longest living people are actually in the United States. Um, and one of the uh, one of the big things that I think I can say, because we've already, he's already written a piece on, on our site, on, and, and you'll like this, one of the best things you can eat for longevity is St. Louis style pork ribs. Um, and one of the reasons is the very high menaquinone uh, concentration um, uh, in, in, in that. Um, and he feels is one of the big contributors to, to longevity is, is that. So I think it's obviously a hugely multifactorial thing, isn't it? But um, um, I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know if, um, uh, if we've, there, there's so much that I think we've, we've sort of got wrong um, when we look at what the general medic medical community is, is representing, which we'd obviously agree on. Um, it, it's, it's hard to say if, um, what, what, what could we be living, you know, how long could we be living? I think it's a lot longer than the, obviously, than, than uh, the average age uh, right now. And, and even people that are doing fairly well, you know, um, I haven't answered that very well. I made a bit of a mess of that, but um, um, yeah, I, I, I think that um, I've obviously been influenced with paleo nutrition. I've, I'm very, very interested in what you are doing. Um, and my interest now is I actually just watched uh, Kiss the Ground last night. Uh, have you seen that yet? Yeah, I think I have. In fact, I might have the producer that coming on to talk to us. In, in oh, the really? Future. Yeah. There's a number, a number of recent films that have come out that have kind of, they're all the same thing: Sacred Cow, Kiss the Ground, Soil yeah. Power, and Cowboys. There's, there's quite a, there's quite a bit of that coming out there, which I think is is great. Hopefully, it'll get the exposure that some of the, you know, uh, contrary uh, stuff has gotten. So hopefully, yeah. we'll see that. So I, I guess my interest in terms of you know, I, I, I thought you know when it, when when Cordain presented this to me it was sort of like QED makes sense and then you, your knowledge gets challenged even more recently with um, I don't know if you're familiar with we've done some uh, interviews with Dr. London he's a researcher that is working down in uh, Ecuador with kind of the last tribe left um, the uh, Warani tribe um, that, that literally sort of untouched by westerners and, and what is interesting with him is his research was sort of talking about how they are almost wholly um, animal and fruit based. So they, they shun away from uh, leaves, um, which if you do look, obviously they're, they're going to have the higher anti-nutrients in them compared to fruits um, and then animals. So that, that sparked my interest there. And, and then the other side of the coin is to then think about, when looking at what you are doing and, and, um, and the results people are getting with a carnivore approach and certainly the work of Toth and Clemens, um, which I'm fascinated by, um, 
is is there a genetic component to something like like for someone that is uh, down in 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 the Amazon where fruit is always going to be available, how would they do going into ketosis versus a northern European whose genetics probably would have you know obviously you know had uh, many occasions of going in into ketosis. So I, I'm I'm interested in whether there's a, there becomes a genetic component to this. And perhaps that's why, you know, I see the vast majority of people commenting on, on your feed. It's like positive, positive. Once in a while, you'll have a negative. Maybe that person, you know, has genetics that perhaps a little bit of fruit would be better for them. You know, I you know, don't know the answer, but, but I think ultimately all of this stems to, you know, eat, eat natural foods. Is, is I guess the simplistic approach to it. And then you can do your own experimentation of what that is. So, you know, a spectrum of, of you know, so for some people they might be able to handle some of the uh, vegetables that others can't. Um, so I, I almost look at nutrition now as I try and say, well, rather than argue, should it be a carnivore diet, a paleolithic diet, a vegan diet, whatever it might be, we could probably have agreement on what the results need to be. So would we all agree that the diet should create metab a, a, a healthy metabolic control so that we don't have insulin at the roof, et cetera, et cetera? I think we'd probably go, yeah. Do we agree that it needs to provide sufficient nutrients? Yeah. Do we agree that it needs to not have a lot of anti-nutrients that can be problematic to you? Yes. And so you start to look at that, and then I think you go yes to all of those. They go, well, what is you know, sufficient nutrients. Well, it also changes, right? It changes when you're in ketosis versus when you're not in ketosis. You know, you look at vitamin C, for example, you know, carnitine is, is a huge component to that and you get a lot of that in meat. And so your vitamin C uh, requirement likely goes down because vitamin C makes carnitine, can be used to make carnitine. So there's a lot of variables in there but it doesn't change our agreement as to what we were trying to do. So in this particular individual that's in ketosis, they have sufficient nutrients. So we've checked that box. Then we have um, the, the, the anti-nutrient content. Maybe some people are able to handle some anti-nutrients a little bit better. Maybe they have less epidermal growth factor receptors. Maybe there's a dairy component within that. Do they have a healthy gut? Do they have leaky gut? So if we look at nutrition like that, then we can come and go, well, that, what's going to work best for me i think there will always be in my opinion if you look at that and agree with that i think you need animal protein in there i think you um may need based on your genetics some fruit that's probably where it ends um i don't think you need anything more than that um the, the, the more reading i've done of late so mm -hmm. i've certainly sort of started finding an interest in that. And I, I've never done what you're doing. I, I probably should. I, I probably should experience it. Um, but, yeah, it, I think it's, it's, it's worth, you know, a 90 day experiment, I think, for most people just to see. And I, and I, and yeah. I totally uh, agree with, with what we're going on. And I, and I certainly see many, many people do well. Not everybody does as well as others. Um, I think there's one thing that I hope to do within this community is we collect data and we can kind of analyze and try to figure out if there's some sort of con commonality in people that may need to add that fruit in versus ones that, that may not need to. Right. So be something interesting to discover and see what's different about that person versus this person. Um, you mentioned pork and maybe you're aware of this. You probably are. I always point out Hong Kong as a, as a you know, just as a counter to the blue zones. I look at the Hong Kong lifespan. They live as long or longer than anybody else on the planet. There's 7 million of them, which is many fold larger than all the blue zones combined. Yeah. And we see that they eat more meat than anybody on the planet and pork being the meat of choice throughout Asia. And so that's just yeah. kind of an interesting finding. Interesting. That, uh, yeah. So that may that. well be this Manaquinone thing because um, certainly we were working on a paper with COVID. Uh, and interestingly, when COVID went down through the Warani tribe down there, it was, you know, it, you know, it hit them some, you know, some, I mean, obviously, even in a, in a tribe like that, you are going to have some diabetics. So there were, there were a few people that lost their life, I believe. But for the most part, it, it didn't you know, ravage like it has the rest of the world. So um, and I, we were looking at the, the, the mechanism because, you know, the menaquino is being lipid soluble. And that's where the virus has been. You know, it's, it's, it's at that mitochondrial 
membrane level. Um, and so the lipid soluble antioxidants are so important in that regard. So I, I think that, um, yeah, look, I mean, I, I, I think that I, I hope that, that eventually it's, it's sort of like the truth can come out type of a thing. Cause for so long, it's just like, you, you're just being, you know, like the Paleolithic diet by U S news and world report. I think with the highest ranking we've ever got is, um, you know, like 33rd or something like that, you know, and, and the, the number one diet is the Mediterranean diet. And yet you point out there's, okay, there, there are actual research studies looking at metabolic control of the, the Mediterranean versus paleo. Uh, you guys even haven't, haven't even been on the register yet. I'm, I'm sure they'll put you at, uh, Whatever, uh, whatever last is, we'll be there. Yeah, you'll, I'm pretty sure you'll be last. So it's so actually kind of said, funny. <laughs> now it's like, I almost feel like I've been trying to defend the Paleolithic diet right now. I'm like, oh, you guys are here now. Like, <laughs> this is easy. I, we're even allowed some fruits and vegetables in our diet. <laughs> so it's sort of like, thanks, thanks, Sean. You, you, you can take the front row now. You can right, defend exactly. This. Yeah, I know. I feel like so, I've got the front row getting the arrows. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I wanted to, to just go back to... Um, you know, you talk about some of the, uh, I guess, VO2 max adaptations occurring with these high intensity interval stuff. I suspect there's some research regarding mitochondrial proliferation or efficiency that uh, is occurring secondary to that. Have you guys looked into that aspect? And I wonder if diet, because I am, you know, like I said, I am obviously bucking the system when it comes to exercising in high capacity in the absence of carbohydrates. And now I've got uh, within the scope, of, I've got NFL athletes doing this. I've got high level MMA guys winning fights on a carnivore diet. So is there any, does diet impact our exercise capacity in ways outside of, you know, fuel supply? Cause I know we talk about glycogen restoration and what are we burning when we're exercising? And I, you know, I've got one of those little lumen devices. It's, you, I don't know what you think about that. It's just a little RER calculator. It's, you know, it's basically right. comparing oxygen versus CO2 as you blow it out. And I'm, I'm still trying to find a pattern with it. I can get in there and pull a extremely hard, high intense, you know, 113 split and blow into that little thing a few minutes later, it says I'm burning mostly fat or so I'm just kind of, or sometimes it's carbs. I haven't seen a pattern. It's kind of, kind of interesting, but what are your thoughts on the effects maybe on mitochondria or other factors that impact exercise as, as it pertains to diet? I, I think I'm, I'm starting to just sort of realize how adaptable the human body is. Um, cause yeah, I, I just, you know, I just put together this sports nutrition course. And so you go through the literature and it's basically like, okay, so, you know, if, if you're in ketosis, the only, the only sort of events you could do would be this ultra endurance stuff, right? You know, yeah, it can work for that, but there's no way it could work for sprinters or, or for, you know, high intensity. And then you look at what you're doing. So, I mean, you're a human being, <laughs> I don't need there to be some big research study. Like if it didn't work, you would not be able to do what you're doing period, right? It just, it's physiology. So something is obviously enabling the body to, to, you know, I mean, obviously you're going to have good glycogen stores. I mean, the body can, can, can do that um, on, on your diet, no question. So I think part of it as well is, is, is from the training side of things. I mean, people, you know, they don't realize how much endurance training goes on with sprinting. Like when you do an all out effort, 60 seconds, you are probably getting about 60% of the energy from aerobic sources. And people don't realize that. So it's, it, I always tell people like, go look at a sprinter after hundred meters and how out of breath they are. You know, it's not just that they're breathing hard during it, but then of course you have to put back those energy stores. I always say it's like borrowing money from the bank. They don't give it you for free. There's interest there, right? So when you use anaerobic sources, um, particularly with glycolysis and you're producing lactic acid, you've, you've got to put those energy stores back and you need oxygen to put them back. So that's what's driving that post-metabolic effect. You, you know, the epoch or what used to be called oxygen debt, which I wish they just left it at that because I think it's an easier connotation for people to, to sort of get their head around, but you know, the excess post-exercise oxygen consumption, a bit of a mouthful, that will be elevated. It's influenced more by intensity than duration. Um, I did, when we were at Colorado State, we would, we did some work on that. And it can be kind of a cumulative where if you have only, we were having, um, I'm trying to think how long of a recovery. I think we had a 30 minute recovery between these all out minutes. And with only a 30 minute recovery, it literally, the 
oxygen consumption hadn't even got back down to baseline. So it was almost like we were, by spreading it throughout the day, there's a sort of a thought process that we can literally be raising your metabolism. So obviously people with uh, issues with weight loss, it could be very beneficial. But going back to your original question in terms of metabolic fuels, I, I, think, I think the body's just very adaptable. Um, and, you know, and clearly, as you say, you, you just turn it on its head, like, you know, well, you can only do ultra endurance stuff on a ketogenic diet. Well, clearly that's not the case. Um, in terms of answering it from a physiological perspective, I, I don't think I can at the moment, but um, I'm interested to try and dig deeper to try and find out what is going on. Um, and I, I don't, you know, having just done this course, I didn't really see anything in the literature that looked at a, a ketogenic diet in kind of that sort of an athlete. Um, so at this point, I think it's all anecdotal, but I don't care if <laughs> there's enough athletes doing it. It's, it's, it's a real thing that's happening. And, you know, as in a lot of research, research often will explain it later on. It's, you know, I think it's Mike Boyle says, if, you know, I don't follow the research, I'll be 10 years behind <laughs> on, on uh, performance. So I, I, I think that um, uh, we'll perhaps eventually get to understand what's going on metabolically and physi physiologically I don't have the answer right now, but, but clearly it, it's happening, right? I mean, you, you've, you've seen improvements. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's kind of interesting because I've been continuously told you can't do this or can't do that, and I just go ahead and do it. Like, you know, right. I, I've been hurt. You know, I, I recently started playing with jujitsu or something. I was yeah, gonna, I saw that. Yeah. First thing I saw was well, you're going to get smashed by carb eaters you know, not gonna be able to handle it. And I'm going in there and having no problem. I mean, yes, I'm, you know, yes, technically a, a superior athlete. And they, they lump me with people my same size are usually 20 years younger than me just because I'm kind of a big outlier. And they, but I mean, I have no problem staying up stamina wise. I can roll with these guys as long as possible. Now, when they lay on me and they choke me out, that's difficult. I mean, it's, you know, but, but, but it's not due to any kind of metabolic uh, issues that I've found due to due to diet. And the other thing, I, you know, and you're probably aware of this. I mean, I've seen that you know, endogenous glucose production, that is, you know, liver generally breaking down a glycogen, glyco glycolysis is occurring uh, at a very high rate. I think I've seen something like 1500% increase in uh, liver output of glucose during these high intervals, high exercise intervals. So assuming, uh, you know, and I've talked to guys like uh, Don Lehman who's talking, you know, there's, there's plenty of studies that show that the humans refill their liver glycogen overnight, particularly when protein is adequate. And I think this is one of the one of the distinguishing factors between a classic ketogenic diet, which tended to be modest to even kind of low protein, I consider low protein the standard American diet of 15%. Whereas I think maybe you would agree that the sort of indigenous people eating maybe 30% of their, their calories coming from protein probably makes a difference when it comes to gluconeogenesis, but potential and glycogen restoration and, and you know, glycogenolysis and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's interesting because actually the um, uh, Toth and Clemens, they're, they're that they actually make the point that they, they're not a high protein, right? They're, right. they're more, more on the high fat. You'd, but, you'd but, say your, your version is more high protein and moderate fat? Well, I think, you know, even with Toth and Clemens, you know, they're two to one protein, you know, that, that, that's about a 20% protein, which is still relatively high to the standard yeah. diet. So right. the standard yeah. American diet is 12 to 16%, depending on who you read. Right. I'm probably more to 30%, so beyond that. But again, they're... And I've talked to Sophia and, 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 and Chaba many times. They're treating sick people with cancer. And, and, right. and, and I'm, you know, a lot of times it's athletes. And I think there's a, there's a difference there. You know, I think higher protein, if you're, if you're an endurance athlete, as you know, I mean, you're, you're breaking down a lot of muscle, as even endurance athletes more. But what I'm doing is also doing that. So I think there's a, there, you, you're putting in that part of the equation, which I don't think. Well, I, I think, think I mean, the one athlete. thing, yeah, I mean, having just done this course development, that, that is one thing, though, that, that I think that is in the literature now is, is the protein requirements for athletes, that even endurance athletes. It's now, and, and it's like anything always, we sort of start here and we kind of climb and eventually the finish line, we end up going, oh, you know, what? we were way off. And so now, you know, you look at the sort of sprinters, it's the, you know, maybe the 2.8 uh, uh, grams yeah, per kilogram. Kilo, yeah. Um, as opposed, you know, and then you start to look at the average person. It's like, why are we recommending the average person 0.8 and an elite athlete? Why, why don't we all try and be elite athletes? You know, like, okay, you're just a human being, so you can have 0.8, but, oh, you're an Olympic sprinter. We're going to give you 2.8, 0.8, 2.8. 
where's that and that, how does that work? It's crazy. So do you know what you are in terms of grams per kilogram? Uh, yeah, I'm probably, uh, so I'm about 110 kilos right now. So I would say I'm closer to three on average. Yeah. So somewhere so, around I, and so what I was going to say was, if you start to look at the literature now, I think that's where the number's starting to go to. And even for endurance athletes, I think th they might not need that much, but, but um, I think they're, they're going to be beneficial. Certainly over two is, is the stuff I'm seeing now where people are going to be beneficial. So, um, the, the, yeah, coming back, I want to, and, and, and I, I, you know, now that we started this, I'd love to stay in contact and, and, and be part of the, the message of this regenerative um, I just wrote an article and we haven't put it out yet because actually even on my own team, I was getting some pushback uh, where they were like, Hey, we've got to really kind of accept that, you know, you know, we've got to have more plants, you know, and, and I'm like, no, hang on a minute. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not ready to say that, you know, let, let's, and so I, 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 one of the guys, I mean, what's really cool is when you're on a team where there's no agenda other than the truth. And so when we're called out, everyone's like, Hey, yeah. Okay. So, that's, you know, I'm quote unquote, the chief science officer for the paleo diet. And uh, our goal is just that, like what it, people go, well, you're biased. I'm like, not really. We could call our, our website, the optimal human nutritional diet. So if it, if we're wrong now and we should not have, for example, any vegetables in there, if it proves down the way, we just go, Hey, we were wrong. What's, what's, there's, what's the harm in being wrong and making a change in your position if that's beneficial to people? So when people go, well, you're biased. I'm like, no, no, I'm biased towards optimal nutrition. Yes. But that optimal nutrition can change. It can go anywhere. And actually it would be like, that would be a very good marketable thing to actually admit you were wrong and change. Look at um, what's his name? Tim Noakes. I mean, he was a big carb guy. Right. And, and he, he said, uh, you know, I was basically being funded by the industry that I was researching and, and he's changed his tune. So he's very believable. Um, so I think that uh, the, the thing for me that I think is probably one of the most important things now is what I watched last night, this, this regenerative, you know, and, and get this message out. I mean, you know, the, the one farmer in that movie of, of literally the field next to him is just dirt. And his is now this, you know, flourishing. Uh, and it's like, we've got to stop lies. You know, we've got to get truth out there. And, um, and so anything, um, we, you know, we might have a disagreement on what is the perfect optimal diet, but I, we're, we're going to be pretty close, right? And it's probably splitting hairs as to what is the best. And it's like, at that point, it's like, hey, do what, what makes you happy. But let, let's at least make those decisions based on, on scientific truth as opposed to, you know, uh, a, a propaganda, um, uh, political agenda. Um, and let people then decide what the only way. And if it's an ethical thing, hey, I, I'm not going to judge anyone. If that's what they feel, that's fine. But at least have that discussion on facts, not on on fiction. Yeah, and I, and I will, would, would not be so arrogant as to think that I know what the perfect optimal human diet is. I think you're right. I think it's something that's still, we're, we're kind of, you know, I think maybe we're, we're, we're slowly getting that. And I think it's going to vary from, from individual to individual to some degree. Yeah, uh, and, you know, it's what's sustainable. Again, you know, some people would say that, you know, if, if the perfect optimal diet was to eat, you know, grubs, that may be true. But then again, you got to get some people that will accept and do that. And most people perhaps wouldn't even want to do that. So you've got to, you've got to say what's, what's optimal and what's achievable. And I think those things may not be necessarily aligned, but I think it's great. You know, I, I have, you know, interviewed, talked to, promoted these folks in this regenerative agricultural uh, uh, realm many, many times to continue to do that. So it's great to have another a person to kind of seize the, the, the potential benefit of that. And I think that's huge. Uh, Mark, yeah. is there anything else? Cause I don't want to, we usually go an hour and I don't want to take up any more of your time. I've been very, very glad we did. This has been very enlightening. I think this has been a great uh, bunch of information we've exchanged here. Anything else you'd want to share out there that didn't, we didn't c cover that's it's within your purview? Uh, let's see. We've, we've kind of covered my nutritional approach i mean i do i mean i've got a couple of uh in terms of the anti-nutrient thing i remember one of the things that really influenced me and it was going back to autoimmunity um it was a a lady that had multiple sclerosis and had heard about 
um, the, the diet that we were recommending from one of the lectures. So when we had our weekly meetings, I, that's the sort of thing I enjoy doing, you know, with, with people. So I, you know, I always used to volunteer to go and meet with people. And, and it was one of those things where we were literally going, look, I have no idea if this is going to help you. There certainly has been some research showing elimination diets can be beneficial with autoimmunity. We had no experience with multiple sclerosis at that time. So anyway, she, um, you know, again, it's like, but I know this isn't going to hurt you, you know, so we're taking out all of the, the processed foods, all of the grains, the legumes, taking out dairy, that's going to leave you with, you know, animal protein, it's going to leave you with some fruits and vegetables, few nuts and seeds type of approach. So um, she starts doing this. And this is a woman who she said at the time, like, a, a day for her, like she put in a load of laundry, and that was about the energy she had and she'd be back to bed for the rest of the day. So hugely um, uh, problematic in terms of her life, the, 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 the MS and her condition. So she started doing the diet. And in a very short period of time, matter of weeks, started to see some benefits, energy levels coming up. Um, a lot of the symptoms of the MS, a lot of the tingling and the sort of uh, sensations she would have were dissipating. Um, and anyway, um, I'm trying to think of the, 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 the way this happened. Oh, that's right. So um, she was doing very well and she had a friend that actually had uh, fibromyalgia and she said, could it help with that? And I said, again, I don't know, but I, I certainly won't do any harm. So we, we met with her and this, this one lady, she was like, oh, there's no way I can't, uh, I, I can't, there's no way I'm gonna take dairy out of my diet. So I was like, oh, okay. So the meeting kind of ended, but in that meeting, uh, green beans came up and I mistakenly said, well, they're, they're not as acidic. I think you can have green beans, but you know, a legume is a legume, right? It's got the same genus. So this particular lady with MS loved green beans. So she went home and ate green beans uh, for two days and called me up and says, well, obviously I can't do green beans. I've had a terrible response to that. And that was the only thing that she added into a diet. So like, whoops, my fault, sorry. Yeah, so I took those back out. Things started to get better again. And then one of the things we had been looking at, Cordain was like, look at this. And there was a, a paper uh, on a case study of someone with uh, MS in the UK eating a lot of brain to get DHA. Um, and seeing huge benefits from the regeneration of the myelin sheath. So we were like, okay, go, go to the local health food store, get some DHA. So she goes, gets DHA, takes like two pills and calls me up and goes, well, clearly I can't do DHA. I had a terrible reaction, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, there's no, like, there's no, you know, even Cordain was like, well, you know, the fatty acid ratios, I said, you know, Dr. Cordain, there's no way the two pills could change any sort of concentrations in the body. There's gotta be something else in that pill. Get me. So I, got a hold of her, got the bottle. And basically what had happened was the, the company had darkened. It said like the, uh, the herbal extract carob was in there to darken the gelatin capsule for, for, to stop the oxidation. Well, obviously carob is not a herb. It's, it's a, a bean extract. So we'd established that. So it was an interesting sort of case that when people have autoimmune disease, it, they can't mess around with this. They have to be very, very strict. To, to elucidate what are the problematic things that are inducing and it. It shouldn't be a stretch to realize if a kid can have a peanut allergy where literally something's touched the peanut can cause an anaphylactic shock, then surely we could extrapolate that to go, look, you know, an autoimmune disease could come from peptides that are getting into our system that, that our body doesn't want. So that was a, that, that memory of that was hugely uh, influential on, on, on how I then worked with people in terms of realizing, you know, you, you can't mess around with this. And I will say one other thing recently is I had a client who literally their gut was so messed up that they were literally wearing diapers. That's how bad they were. So I was like, okay, you know, and all of the sort of reading and I actually put them on essentially a carnivore diet with, with some fruit. Um, I was trying to almost mimic the Warani tribe and literally within days, they started to see improvements. So I, I think, again, it's, it's having an open mind um, to, to all of this because, you know, it's so easy to be dis dismissive of anything that's different or new or that sounds crazy. You know, uh, I mean, it's so easy to um, uh, say well, you're not going to get all your nutrition if you're on a carnivore diet and go, well, actually, you, anyone can do it. Just go to the USDA. <laughs> Pretty much everything that you need can be 
obtained from animal source nutrition. Have you read, I'm sure you have, you read the O'Hearn paper? Uh, oh, Amber's paper, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, because yeah, yeah, that's actually, you, you type in carnivore, that's the only one that comes up. I wish it was open access for people because um, it's a very good paper, I think. It's a very, really nice summary. Um, and it actually brings up, and I will ask you, what, what are your thoughts on, uh, on calcium? Um, is it something that, that people well, need to be I, cognitive of if they do you know again I, again i guess you could you know if you say strict meat you're going to obviously you're not going to hit your usrda of calcium i mean it's going to be very challenging to do so now again if you look at uh even i'll look at walter willett who would be an unlikely ally in this situation but he he maintains that the calcium requirements particularly for adults are way overestimated and we see that uh you know, again, around high protein diets, and I think this has been clear that we see the calcium absorption goes up significantly on high protein diets. And so one of the thoughts was, one of the old thoughts was that, you know, high protein diets led to hypercalcuria due yeah. to bleaching of the bones. And that's not been shown to be true. It's been shown that calcium is just greatly absorbed in the GI tract. And that's why you end up with that. I've yet to see somebody with a serum calcium deficiency. Again, that's obviously we, we, there's a lot of mechanisms to maintain serum calcium. And so you could argue you're leaching from the bone, but I, I, again, I've not seen any evidence of calcium deficiency in anybody that's either plus or minus dairy so far. And again, obviously you would, you would say, maybe we're going to see osteopenia developing 20 years from now. That, that's hard to measure, obviously, but yeah. I have seen, I have seen actually some people recover some, some osteopenia on this diet. Really? And again, bone is, is, as we know, is 40, maybe 50% protein by, by, by uh, substance. So it's not just a, a stick of chalk. And so um, I do think it's interesting. Um, I, you know, I, I, think, I, I know uh, Lauren was always like, that was a big thing with him on, on um, when he is, you know, argued against going into a sort of a ketogenic diet. He's big on that. And I think he often uh, mentions um, uh, Stefan, um, his Stephanson. work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, with I think the um, the Inuit, I think he was sort of arguing that they did sometimes have some calcium issues, but that's also um, modern day. Perhaps you know something had changed in in their diet. You know, with with time, who knows? Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that um, you know these these are questions that obviously we hopefully can can, can get answers to. But anecdotally, you're not seeing an issue, so. Um, I think that's interesting. Are, are you, how are you doing on your fundraising, by the way, on that clinical trial? That yeah, so we are, uh, you know, I think we're, last I checked, 150. Uh, I think we're going to get another, we have another larger donation coming. So we're, we're, we're making progress. You know, we may, we may seek out some, uh, some grant funding, partial funding or some other stuff. You know, we're looking into those options as well. Uh, so we, you know, we want to do a, a fairly large intervention trial, which as you know, is, is not cheap, you know, particularly yeah. when you're talking hundreds of people, it, it gets very expensive to manage them, to do the labs and all that stuff. So we're, where, we're, where are you we're, hoping to do the actual research? Do you, do you have a plan? Well, we, we may do it remotely just because that's one of the things with coronavirus. It's tough. You know, if you run a research protocol and then they shut you down because of, you know, it's so, so it may make sense. And, and that's a lot of what we do here. It's so, so on top of just implementing diet we also have a system of, of, of online support so we may tie that into that so it's mm. it's one of those things is showing that you know that this is how we, we we get people healthier but uh we've had a lot of, we've talked to a number of researchers that uh you know that were, were interested in perhaps doing it you know this was a few months ago we we're doing some discovery on how much would it cost are you capable and some of them, some of us said i can handle 20 people but i can't handle 200 people and so it depends on you know right. that type of thing so it might yeah, be it's nice. definitely it's important research to be done isn't it and uh um yeah I, the, the, one one last question that i i'm interested in is we've always sort of been you know we we realize there are plenty of people that disagree with this but we've always been on the sort of the one of the few things that we would have, have agreed on with the usda as a position um but again open-minded could could easily be wrong uh is the sodium uh part of it and so i've always been someone that hasn't you know, consumed a lot of, I've never added sodium. I've never sort of added it in my cooking, everything else. And I remember actually talking with Rob Wolf. I remember one of his comments on uh, someone who's like, try going into the hot climate. And I'm, I'm in the desert of California, a, a British guy with red hair and freckles. And, and I have no problem out here with, with my training and everything else. And I've never sort of had, added salt. So, and if we look at, you know, our position is, if you look at it from a natural perspective, and I've never bought into humans going to a salt lick and, and seeing that, I've kind of 
said, hey, yeah, I, I think that's about the right amount that we should have, that sort of a natural amount. And I also see Toth and Clemens seem to be on board with that, but I think you, you actually add a fair amount of salt within the thing, or, do, or what, what would you say your, your sodium intake is? You know, I just basically salt the taste. I don't have any. Oh, really? I don't really sit there and, and sort of make sure I hit a certain amount. I think, you know, I think beyond, you know, you know, as you know, when you go to a low carb diet, there's a little naturesis that's occurring. Yeah. And I think you maybe have to compensate that in the beginning. But then once you kind of get past that, I mean, there's sodium in meat. I mean, it's not like you're not getting right. sodium in meat and meat and meat, sure. you know, the myoglo. Well, I mean, it's there. And and so yeah. I, I don't think that's a, a major issue for most people. What we found, and I, you know, I do, I have seen people that have issues with cramping, and probably more effective in my experience in, in, in this various in person. person so you've, had, you, you, you've seen people cramping in, in which? Well, on this from, diet, on the carnivore diet, oh, okay. diet we right. often see that, that, that that often has to do with a protein to fat ratio. And then and sometimes if you're getting too much protein, you remember probably, I'm, I'm sure you remember one of the early side effects reported with creatine when the creatine supplement came out was muscle cramps and then that was yeah. later sort of i don't know dismissed or somehow but you know i'm eating a lot i think of that might have been a hydration factor i think right. uh, yeah but i'm eating a lot of creatine as well and you know maybe i'm dehy you know maybe i'm not you know, if you're not taking a fluid in or you know if you're if the fat to protein you're not supplementing with creatine you're just saying no you know, that'd, be a waste, that'd be a complete waste of time you yeah know, right totally superfluous. yeah yeah right I don't do that at all so yeah yeah so um yeah, I, I think all of this is is fascinating, and I think that um, you know, obviously, you know, it's it's rewarding when I you know I've I've looked at a lot of your posts, and you know, when you see people whose lives have been changed for the better, like why why wouldn't one why wouldn't you want to support that? Um, you know, and hey, maybe some people will do it going going an alternate route, but um, I, I I've always been someone even on a Paleolithic diet to favor the the protein you know i mean if 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 um I've, I've i've never i know a lot of people in in this world will have always tried different diets i've never ever tried a vegetarian or a vegan diet um i've had meals that don't have protein and even one meal without protein for me i i often feel that, that like I'm you didn't, like you didn't eat. <laughs> yeah I, it's like so I'm, I'm watching you some of these videos and like like yeah, I, I I could get that. So I, I I do think it's something I should um, should jump into and 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 because I, I I know I've never been in ketosis, for example. I mean, like, it's so I'm sure there are people listening to this go, "Well, he's an idiot. Why hasn't he tried it?" Um, I, I guess I haven't tried it simply because, you know, I'm now I'm older than you. I'm 57, and I still feel like I could go out and compete on the U.S. rugby team. Like I I watch this the game against New Zealand and I'm just like, they got to learn to pass the ball off in the tackle. <laughs> I'd probably get crushed. I realize that, but um, I still feel very fortunate. I feel as fit as I was in my twenties and I'm never sick. And, you know, people usually look at me and go, wow, you're 57. And, and I'm always offended when people don't do that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, I feel that perhaps I've never tried those sorts of things because I, I was, I feel fortunate to bump into Cordain and just happened to be my advisor. And that's been my template um, for a long time. And, I, and I'm not strict. I, I wouldn't say I'm particularly strict. I, I am if I feel I'm ever getting issues. You know, sometimes I feel my skin is a good barometer of my health. So sometimes I'll have, I was as a kid, I had uh, sort of some psoriasis and uh, that all cleared up when I went paleo. But, you know, if I, um, you know, I, we know being rugby players, we, we loved our beer and I love nothing more than a sort of a Trappist ale, but my body does not like it. So, you know, I, I might like have one of those now and again. And uh, if I try to have too much, I, my skin will tell me. So it's sort of almost, it, I almost look at that as a positive because it, it, it enables me to go, hey, hey, you know, that, that's too much for you. Your body doesn't like it. So I think I'm able to starve off sort of more serious issues. Um, but yeah, it, it, I, I, we definitely need to stay in contact. And I, um, I definitely need to start supporting the ranchers that you uh, um, are always saying we should support. And uh, I'd love to be part of trying to share that message because I think that that is a, a bigger part of this is, is that that environmental regenerative uh, issue needs to get out there for sure. Yeah, I think I think uh, and, and uh, certainly we have to be, yeah, we have to, not wait 25 years to talk to each other again. So definitely we'll get you back on because this has been fascinating. And if you, you know, if, if you're looking for, 
things from a research angle, I'm sure we've got lots of volunteers that would be willing to uh, lend their, uh, you know, lend whatever to, to, the, to the research angle because we all want to support this. And I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, if we, if it turns out that crazily enough the food we've been eating for 3 million years as a species is actually good for us, <laughs> perhaps we shouldn't uh, erase that from the human menu. I, 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 I'm yeah. deaf. Yeah. Whether or not I end up uh, becoming a full carnivore or whether I end up becoming the Warani carnivore plus a little fruit or whether I um, do what I've been doing for the past 30, what is it now? I was in my early 20s, so I can't do the math. Obviously, my brain is tired. So um, 25 or so, yeah. Um, it's more like 30 now. So anyway, whether I do that, I, I think I'm probably going to be okay on any of those. That That's kind of the bigger bigger thing. It's, it's most people, I, I think obviously if there are autoimmune issues, then the first thing I, these days I think I would do is go, go carnival for, for an autoimmune patient. I, I think it's hard to not argue that because certainly, you know, the only issue that, that I would have said, you know, I would have said, well, of course, you know, most humans would have been, you know, in primitive times would have uh, had to go into ketosis because at certain times of the year they wouldn't, obviously that's not true in certain parts of the world, but for a lot of us, it would be. So, my I was my question would have always been yeah but it's not good long term and I, I think I had seen some stuff where there had been thyroid issues with ketosis going on for a long time but clearly that's that might be the case for some people but clearly you've been, you've been full carnivore now for what three four years? and a half years yeah, four long? and a half years four and a half years so right yeah. and um, anyway. I know people go well you're an N of one but you know you get an N of one <laughs> multiplied by few thousand people you know that's i think that's pretty it's pretty valid um yeah. so yeah and, and, and so that obviously you know the, the the thing that you know short term is the only way to go the only thing that, that could be of interest there is there a genetic component are some people as you said earlier some people are gonna do better than others and so what's what's the harm in trying right i agree well mark i'll tell you what um where do people go if they want to find out more? Because you've, you've got some fascinating stuff. Where where would they find out more about you? What I want to follow you on Instagram because I, I I I hesitate to type in Mark Smith because there's probably seven thousand of them. So well, I've actually my, so my, my I'm I'm embarrassed to say I, I these days that I I've moved into so much of the a different area area of my work now that I can't handle more people. So I, I'm not trying to market myself. So okay. my, uh, my website is, is, is not very good, but I do have a website, uh, which is docsmith.org. Um, I'm not particularly big on social media, but maybe that's okay. I mean, I think you post a lot. Um, they won't have to, uh, uh, do a lot of reading if they want to follow me because I don't post a hell of a lot and it's, uh, some personal stuff, some, some, but if I've written an article on the paleo diet, that's where I would post it. So you can then go read. And I, and certainly if you want to see some of my writings, uh, go to the paleo diet.com. Um, and just, you can find me as one of the, the, um, writers and you can see articles I've, I've written and I've got one coming up, uh, which is, I think it's titled is, uh, veganism and vegetarianism, uh, better for the environment um and that's in 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 content review right now and it's stalled because i wanted to watch kiss the ground before i added a few more points into it um and then my instagram is at doc mark smith d-o-c mark smith at doc mark smith all right well perfect mark thank you so much so let's let's sleep in contact maybe it's again yeah, for sure like i said you well just, we, you're you, you're you, not you, that you far get, away from me right you're you're in southern california right i'm in i'm in laguna hills for for, for now but i'm actually going to be moving out of state to washington uh later this summer so uh, well, well then i should probably here. try and get myself over there and maybe do a workout with you although i think i great. haven't been working out too hard lately so i i better get my uh my butt back in the gym if i'm going to come and uh, train with you <laughs> otherwise I'm going to be embarrassed so uh, but yeah we should do that before you go to Washington I'm in you know I'm in the desert of California so I'm only a couple of I mean what Alif Laguna is what probably three hours to get to you I'm Something in like Palm that. Springs yeah I think it's somewhere in there I, I can't say I've driven through Palm Springs but yeah well before you move up there I should definitely make a trip out yeah we can jump on a roar I'm, I, and I've you've inspired me to continue doing what I'm already doing so I'm gonna go I'm yeah for sure well I don't, I don't think you need any education on the, <laughs> everything I've seen you do is like yep that's how you do it and yeah. uh 
I'll, I'll come out and eat some steak with you. That'd be great. All right, Mark. Take care now. Have a great, right, great day. Thanks. Everybody else, we'll see everybody else tomorrow, guys. Take care now. Bye-bye. Thanks for thanks for Thanks, having guys. Me.